It is an honor for me to be here today and to participate in the deliberations of this conference. The overall topic uh, we are considering is uh, of great importance to the progress of the faith. Baha'i scholarship is a vast field of diverse activity, and it is by no means my intention um, to address it in any uh, co uh, comprehensive way. What I hope to do is to make a modest contribution to this gathering by presenting some of the thinking uh, behind the programs of the Institute for Studies in Global Prosperity, which is only working in a relatively narrow area of the field. Its mandate is to learn systematically about enhancing the capacity of individuals and groups to participate in the prevalent discourses of society. One of the first questions we had uh, to address as we began to respond to this mandate was regarding the attitudes we were going to adopt towards the existing body of knowledge of humanity, which is of course growing in an astounding rate. Clearly, as Baha'is, we believe that this is the age of humanity's transition from childhood to maturity. To what extent, then, does present knowledge belong to childhood, and to what ex extent is it already the harbinger of maturity? There is no easy answer to this question. It is not difficult for us to see that the affairs of the world at this stage of evolution are in disarray. The wars, the terrorism, the degradation of the environment, the state of oppression under which large populations of human beings live, and numerous other dreadful conditions remind us of the magnitude of the forces of disintegration that are operating in the world and confirm us in our belief that the present order is defective indeed. But underneath this order lies a system of thought and knowledge. Can this system be adequate yet give rise to such a defective order? Is our plight a result of building faulty structures on a sound and proven foundation? In following this line of questioning, we are cognizant of the dangers of extreme, main, namely to reject all the accomplishments of humankind as childish, irrelevant, or wrong, and dream about the appearance of the mature sciences of the future. This is certainly not what is done in the life of the individual as he or she passes through various stages. During childhood, we develop many elements of our character and personality and many intellectual tools we use throughout our lives. We don't throw those out as we grow up. We build on them. The implications of these thoughts for our endeavors are clear. We have to approach our participation in the discourses of society with full mastery of the relevant fields of knowledge, yet we have to do so critically. The level of our acceptance of any set of statements would vary from field to field. In the physical sciences, for example, we may believe that in a distant future, some other powerful theory will emerge that will give us far more insights into physical reality than, say, quantum mechanics. But we would not expect such a theory to prove quantum mechanics wrong. It would simply define the range of its validity, as it did with the Newtonian physics. Thus, we would approach today's theories of physics and their applications with a great deal of confidence. But when it comes to the field of education, for example, 
with its propensity to follow fads and fashions, we would be far more critical. This does not mean that we would reject everything offhand. We would study prevalent theories carefully and gain as many insights from them as they can offer. But we would not become too attached to them. Thus, the degree of credulity and incredulity would vary from field to field. And the capacity to do so, which includes the capacity to examine in the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation, the assumptions underneath a given set of statements that claim to describe or explain some aspect of reality, particularly social reality, would be foremost in our mind as we try to contribute to the capacity of individuals and groups to participate in the discourses of society. This task of analyzing and questioning assumptions is not a simple one, and it cannot be reduced to a formula that, for example, if certain assumptions of a theory are wrong or don't agree with the Baha'i teachings, then we throw away the theory. For example, many scientists carrying out research on the intricacies of the theory of evolution believe that the human being is just an advanced animal. We don't. We believe in the existence of the soul that is exalted above the physical universe. But this does not imply that we would look at the theory of evolution with suspicion. When the progressive mapping of the genomes of different species allows us to practically see the relationship among the species, we would not deny an extraordinary theory that explains so many observations. What we would do is to argue that the assumption of the non-existence of the soul is not necessary for the success of the theory of evolution. And the scientists who make that, this assumption are going out of their own sphere of competence. We could then, if we wish, comment on certain statements of the theory showing that we could make additional statements that would not contradict them. For example, saying that as complexity grows in the process of evolution, a condition is reached that consciousness and the powers of this mind emerge, and the statement that as complexity grows, a condition is reached in which the powers of the soul with its own independent existence begin to appear in the human being are not contradictory. The latter goes further than the former in a direction that science does not need to and should not move. Our conviction that competition, for example, cannot be the organizing principle of society does not mean that we cannot appreciate great advances in the field of economics, which seem to explain many things in the world, at least in its present state. Even while disagreeing with one assumption, we may find another premise quite appealing. For example, the principle of diminishing return. The way we see and interact with humanity's growing body of knowledge depends to a large extent on our understanding of issues surrounding the relation between science and religion. And this gives rise to a second set of questions we have had to address. Our position in this respect is of course defined by the principle of harmony between science and religion. But we found that there are a number of ways this principle can be understood by Baha'is according to each person's views on science and religion. For example, one could... Thank you. Thank you so much. For example, one could hear statements here and there, probably based on our shared belief that Baha'u'llah had access to all knowledge, implying that in principle, it is possible to find all truths of science by reading the scriptures if we became spiritual enough and equipped with the right kind of hermeneutics. 
There are also statements reflecting, usually inadvertently, a secular position that the truths of religion will finally be explained by science and that the language of religion is a useful but pre-scientific way of explaining things that science will gradually explain. A more widespread view based, we thought, on a partial reading of certain statements of Abdul Baha separated science and religion sharply from each other. Science finds truths in the empiricist version about the universe and society, and religion provides the values needed to exercise science properly and to put such gifts of science and technology as the science of the gifts of science as technology, the knowledge of systems and processes, and scientific explanations of human behavior into good use. Without entering into debate on the merits of such views, we decided that they were not adequate for our purposes. As it turned out, a deceivingly simple statement about science and religion already put forward by a partner organization served us well in our subsequent explorations. To speak of science and religion as two complementary and overlapping systems of knowledge and practice provided us with a language that facilitates the analysis of the two systems in comparable ways and enabled us to focus on the role of knowledge in the civilization building process in which the Baha'i community is engaged. I should remind us at this point that these discussions were carried out in relation to our mandate to help the friends enhance capacity to participate in some discourses of society. So little wonder that as our ideas about the harmony of science and religion were taking shape, we decided to promote a discourse on the role of science and religion in development with theoreticians and practitioners in the field. There is, of course, already a growing conversation about science and religion worldwide, but we decided to anchor the discourse in the process of social and economic development of the peoples of the world, hoping that we would get insights into the way the two systems contributed to the advancement of civilization. Our efforts actually evoked encouraging responses in the few countries where the discourse was launched, particularly in India, Uganda, and Brazil. But soon, we had to face the limitations of human resources in our own community to sustain and coordinate the many activities that were emerging, the urgent need to increase the community's capacity to participate in the discourses of society had become once more apparent. Although we could not keep expanding what we was proving to be a very rich experience, we were able to learn a great deal about what we had to do in our capacity building efforts. Some of the concepts we had discussed in the context of science, religion, and development were essential for the conceptual framework we had to elaborate for these efforts. Faith, reason, rationality, objectivity are good examples. A definition of faith given by Abdul Baha in the context of religion would have to guide our conversations with those who placed faith and reason in opposition to one another. Faith understood as conscious knowledge and practice of good deeds by no means implies passivity, blind imitation, or ignorance. Faith in the existence of order in the universe, the laws of which are accessible to the human mind, is conscious knowledge essential to the practice of science. No one would argue that the certainty with which scientists hold this article of faith is a result of fuzzy thinking or of deep-rooted psychological needs. Mosid confirmed by the extraordinary success of the system of knowledge and practice we call science. Then why would faith in the inherent nobility of the human being, 
in the strength of justice, in the power of unity, or in a vision of transcendence, above the animal condition be the outcome of blind imitation, irrational thinking, or plain ignorance. As to reason, our concept of religion clearly demands the full employment of the human faculty we call reason in the generation and application of knowledge with which religion is concerned. The Baha'i community certainly employs such tools as analysis, inference, contextualization, justification, and certain methods of science, such as induction and deduction in its reading of the revealed word and in the articulation of the learning that is generated from the application of the teachings in day-to-day -day practice. Let us take the equality of men and women, a fundamental truth about human reality as an example. The Baha'i community accepts the statement that the reality of the human being is his or her soul, and that the soul has no sex, no, and no race, color, nationality, or social class for that matter. Having accepted this as a truth, it has strived since its inception to express it in its own practice and its contributions to the life of society. Has not this effort been an entirely rational one, using the various powers of reason and some of the methods of science? Here I should emphasize a point that I have already mentioned to say that we use scientific knowledge and methods in the application of the teachings to the life of our community and towards the progress of society does not mean that science and religion are collapsed into one amorphous body of knowledge and practice. We neither intend to measure religion with a yardstick of science, nor do we plan to bring religion into the domain of science. Science and religion are two separate systems, each with its body of knowledge and its own set of insights. Any attempt to give a complete account of the world in terms of one or the other leads to false reductions. But this insistence on the fact that the two systems are distinct does not imply that we would divide our lives into two sharply separated compartments. I as a member of the Baha'i community, and I as a member of the scientific community. The governing principle in our individual lives, and of course in all our collective lives, is coherence between the spiritual and the material. In the context of this discussion, this implies that we would not force a separation between the insights we gain from science and the insights we gain from religion. These insights interact in our minds and help us advance in our understanding of reality. And as to objectivity, we constantly have to remind ourselves that objective does not mean true. Objectivity has to do with methods of in inquiry and not with the essence of reality. There is a vast range of phenomena that can and should be studied through the application of methods that adhere strictly to scientific objectivity. But there is a far vaster set of phenomena that cannot in the study of parts of this extended reality, as Thomas Nagel calls it, what may be considered subjectivity has to enter with force. And great parts of this extended reality don't lend themselves to study by human beings at all. The nature of human knowledge Harmony between science and religion, faith, reason, coherence between the spiritual and the material, and objectivity are examples of ideas 
that we have had to discuss time and again as we had tried to meet the challenge of assisting the community build its capacity to participate in the discourses of society. This is not a place to go into details of a few programs we have come up with for this purpose according to the evolving conceptual framework we are trying to elaborate. Everyone here has probably heard of and some have participated in the courses and seminars we are developing for university students, undergraduate and graduate. What seems important to mention here is that we have learned a great deal from our conversations in these courses and seminars. The students often speak of the strong materialistic views they encounter at the university, worldviews that utterly reject their most cherished convictions, leaving virtually no room for dialogue between science and religion. They tell us about their difficulty in expressing their ideas freely, lacking the mental tools to identify and analyze the basic assumptions underlying the theories they are presented. To perform well at the university, they feel they have to think and learn inside the models that dominate the respective fields of study, adopt the methods inherent to these models, profess whatever they hold to be true, and in the final analysis, work on critically to propagate them maintaining a coherent vision of their lives and their involvement in society, and adopting methods that are congruent with their beliefs is a tremendous challenge, challenge for them. In response to such concerns, we try to offer them elements of a conceptual framework that they can each put together as their own, enabling them to take ownership of their education and to prepare themselves adequately to make contributions to their fields without sacrificing their religious beliefs or packing them conveniently in a corner of their lives reserved for religious life. I should mention here that the framework that could govern our participation in the discourses of society is not something entirely new divorced from the framework that governs activity in other areas, particularly growth and social action. The way we understand the process of capacity building to some aspects of which we are contributing is that it seeks the enhancement of a number of interrelated capabilities in the believers that would enable them to focus sizable energy on the twin processes of expansion and consolidation, and at the same time assist interested individuals to lend their talents to social action and to furthering certain discourses in society concerned with the advancement of civilization. Courses and seminars for university students address the challenge of building capacity to participate in the discourses of society to some extent. For some time now, we have been thinking about tackling the question of research in certain areas of inquiry. I would like to say a few words about this aspect of our work and in that context discuss a few other fundamental questions we have had to consider and which seem relevant to the topic of the conference. The initiative involves the development of capacity to describe and analyze in the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation certain global social phenomena. This is a vast area of endeavor that can potentially be approached in any number of ways. Our own capacity and the size of resources at our disposal impose limitations on the kinds of choices we can make. As we have now learned in relation to so many endeavors, it is only wise for us to start small and gradually add more complexity to our work. It seemed clear to us from the beginning that we were not to explore broad disciplines of knowledge, such as history, medicine, education, or economics, what we could do was to help individuals and small groups analyze the evolution of thought 
about a set of interrelated issues associated with the theme of importance for the life of humanity today. An initial review of some pressing issues led us to topics such as poverty alleviation, movement of populations from one geographic area to another, women's health, growth and development of cities, and the role played by mass media in shaping culture and forming public opinion. We decided to choose one of these themes and figure out how a group of people grounded in the teachings of the faith would go about describing the evolving understanding of humanity of the issues involved. How would they study systematically the many facets of a given social phenomenon and through consultation and reflection develop a profound understanding of it. To begin the process, we chose the theme of global movement of populations. Let me emphasize here that what we would like a group of interested individuals to do with our help in, is not field research, say on some aspect of migration in relation to a specific population. We are only concerned for now with the first step of research, forming as thorough as possible a picture of the state of knowledge in an area of inquiry. The material for the study of our group then would be the studies of others, their observations, their thoughts, and their conclusions. This may sound like literature review in some university course, but our task is really far more complex the question before us is this. If a group of people with training in relevant fields examine the body of the observations made about the phenomenon in question, scrutinize and analyze all already offered by others and sort through their conclusions, and at the same time explore the writings for thoughts that shed light on issues at hand, will their understanding of the phenomena be greater than prevalent ones? Will they bring an appreciable number of insights into the area of inquiry because they have benefited from the light of Baha'u'llah's teachings? There are different answers possible to this question. One is don't bring religion into science. This, I have already explained, is not what we intend to do. The other is, of course they will. But then a whole set of issues related to capacity need to be addressed. And here are some examples of such issues. It is important that the group engaged in an area of inquiry, as I am trying to describe here, avoid the simplistic problem-solution mentality. Humanity has such and such problem. Our task is to look into the writings and come up with a solution. This kind of mindset is not the most fruitful for scholarly activity. There are, of course, many principles and concepts in the teachings that need to be brought to bear on any one of the problems of humanity. But these principles have to be applied and this involves a long process in which many different actors must cooperate. Further identifying the principles that must govern such a learning process is only one among the many challenges that have to be met. Thus a mindset according to which enunciation of principles is equated with giving solutions will not help the kind of inquiry we are proposing either. The Universal House of Justice has encouraged the community to be present in the many social spaces in which thinking about policies evolve so that they can, as occasions permit, offer generously, unconditionally, and with utmost humility the teachings of the faith and their experience in applying them as a contribution to the betterment of society. How to offer insights from the writings with humility but with conviction is a question with which we are all faced. 
Clearly, our humble posture of learning is rooted in a consciousness of the limited nature of our comprehension of the writings and limited experience we have in applying them. But at the same time, we must have an unshakable inner belief that Baha'u'llah's revelation is indeed a never-ending so source of insight and guidance. The combination of such humility and such beliefs enables a group engaged in an area of inquiry to examine the social phenomena in question from a fresh perspective. But what do we really mean by a fresh perspective? This is clearly not a question we can answer easily. It is precisely what we have set out to learn. But a couple of examples from our efforts thus far may give us an indication of what our efforts to bring the light of revelation to illumine our understanding as we study and analyze the social phenomena may look like. Let us consider the views we hold about the present world order to which I referred before. The principle of oneness of mankind we know is not a mere call to cooperation among peoples and nations. It implies an organic change in the very structure of society. We anticipate change in the life of the individual and in the relationships that exist among individuals, communities, and institutions. We are certain that the economic, social, and political structures of the world will undergo profound transformation. The global movement of populations, which has assumed impressive proportion in recent decades, is certainly contributing to this transformation. The studies of the phenomena available today clearly acknowledge that something is changing. But you can hardly find a study carried out in the paradigm of change the way we mean it. So there is much said, for example, in favor of geographic mobility because it improves the lives of selected groups of selected groups or contributes to the creation of wealth at the global level and thus strengthens the existing economic system. There is also the opposite, the analysis of the detrimental effects on a sovereign state of losing trained human resources and wealth because of migration. But how would one see the phenomena through the lens of justice, a view that does not excuse injustice, locally, nationally, or internationally? And what insights would one get into the effects of global movements of people if one were aware of the operation of the principle of oneness of mankind and the resulting global civilization that is destined to emerge? Not in the sense of globalization as it is defined today, but according to the vision the Guardian has depicted for us. This kind of thinking has set us on a search for what we may call an ethical orientation to the field informed by the understanding of justice and the oneness of humanity. In an evolving working document that is intended to guide our efforts in this area, we have written the following note to ourselves. In view of the fact that the Baha'i teachings speak directly to many issues related to human mobility, we must necessarily offer thoughts on the normative questions associated with this phenomena. The implications of the principle of oneness, for example, challenge the conceptual basis of the state controls on human movement. Abdul Baha has written, all the world is man's birthplace. These boundaries and outlets have been devised by man. In the creation, such boundaries and outlets were not assigned, but some of the souls from personal motives and selfish interests have divided each one of these continents and considered a certain part as their own country. God has set up no frontier between France and Germany. They are continuous. Notwithstanding the radical implications of this and other principles, we know that Baha'u'llah's vision will not be realized through the subversion of the existing foundations of society, but rather by seeking to broaden its basis to remold its institutions in a manner consonant with the needs of an ever-advancing, ever-changing world. 
Therefore, as we introduce normative considerations into our analysis, we will aim to do so with an extraordinary tone, exploratory tone, instead of describing any narrow course of action. Let us now consider another set of convictions, our view of human nature. Clearly, our belief in the spiritual dimension of a human being is not rooted in a naive attitude toward existence. We have not closed our eyes to the cruelty, injustice, oppression, and thirst for power that permeate human relations. But how will these forces be overcome if humanity insists on building society according to our lower nature? From among the diverse questions that emerge from the two main concerns of research on the theme of global movement of populations, namely why do people move and what happens when they move, one can hardly find any that does not touch on one's conception of human nature. What are people's aspirations? What motivates them to move? What do they expect to get out of geographic mobility? How do they deal with change once they have moved? How do they build new communities? One of our assumptions, one that we are willing to put in for test, is that a more complete conception of the nature of the human being an understanding that benefits both from scientific findings and the, and the relevant teachings of the faith can provide new insights into these questions. The revelation we believe provides us with a lens to see, recognize, and explain behavior ignored by research that is based on materialistic assumptions. What is currently considered normal human conduct is shaped by forces operating in the age of transition. Insights are needed that help explain the forces that motivate the human soul, forces that can, when tapped into, bring out capacities that go unnoticed in today's society. Is this not, after all, the purpose of our research? to generate knowledge that can help transform social reality. If we learn to do it right, we should be able to help groups to overcome the contradictions of those who see no alternative but to try to channel selfish desires and egotistical forces towards collective good. To illustrate this idea, let, me, let us take the question of why people move. The hidden assumption in the general discourse on migration is that people from the developing world would flood Western countries if migration controls were taken away. And most research focuses on the hopes and aspirations of those who decide to leave their homes in search of a better life. But what about those who choose to stay in spite of difficult material conditions? Maybe examining the rationale behind their behavior opens a window into some of the non-material factors that can affect the decision-making process. An appreciable number of the Baha'is of Iran are in fact living examples of individuals and families who have chosen to stay in spite of the consecutive waves of persecution directed towards them the existing body of knowledge will certainly benefit from research based on different assumptions and alternative questions in this respect. My presentation of some of the challenges of ISGP has encountered in trying to contribute to the capacity of Baha'i communities to engage in the discourses of society has already become too lengthy and I should end it. But I would like to share one more thought. When we talk about studying some social phenomena in light of Baha'u'llah's revelation, we need to remember that unlike the fruits of human intellectual endeavors we are used to, his revelation is not a step-by-step -step study of some narrow aspect of reality. It embraces all of reality as a whole. When we go to it for insights, we need to be careful 
not to fragment the teachings according to our own perceptions, zeroing on a few sentences or passages and coming up with formulaic statements that actually limit our explorations of reality rather than constantly opening for us new horizons. Thus, in the study of the phenomena of movement of populations, we cannot focus only on suffering, but we must also describe joy. We must see light despite the darkness in which people and governments constantly get lost. We must be aware of the intricate connections between the processes of integration and disintegration. We should not forget that in real life, joy and sorrow embrace each other. Only in this way, the knowledge we generate in these first stages of inquiry can lead to processes of action and reflection in which the protagonist populations can participate. And the knowledge that will continue to be generated will help the disempowered victims of oppression become effective participants in the civilization building process in which we are all engaged. We need to always remember that this is the kind of knowledge we are seeking through our inquiries. <laughs>